Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today I'm going to be returning to Vietnam 65, a turn-based war game which looks at the Vietnam War in the I Drang Valley in 1965. I've done a couple of videos on this game already, but this video is going to be me taking a look at the uh, veteran level difficulty, which is much more difficult. Now looking at this map here, you can see this is going to be a pretty tough uh, task here. We've got four cities on the top, all linked by roads and relatively open areas, which shouldn't be too difficult to pacify. Uh, but then we've got four cities here in the south, or four towns or hamlets or what have you in the south, which are right in the middle of the jungle with nowhere to land our, our helicopters at because you can't land in a jungle and you can't land in a field. So literally four towns, no, five towns here uh, with no adjacent landing zone. At least one of those is somewhat close to where there's an opening. But yeah, this is going to be a, a tricky proposition to say the least, uh, not to mention the fact that we're playing on veteran difficulty. So a rather difficult map, uh, but we'll see what happens here. Now, the point of this video is not so much to look at the actual gameplay, though. I wanted to talk about the Vietnam War just a little bit. You know, it's it's a war that I know a fair amount about, but mostly just kind of general pop culture history type knowledge. You know, I know about the Tet Offensive, Khe San, the I Drang Valley, um, you know, kind of basic history behind it. But it was never a war that I, I looked too deeply into. Um, I think that's probably the case for a lot of people out there. Vietnam doesn't tend to be a war uh, that people want to remember. Um, and, you know, uh, that's probably popular. World War II is the most popular war in terms of kind of a historical basis of any war that uh, America's been involved with, uh, mainly because, well, it's the good war, if you will. America fighting against the Nazis, a clear evil uh, that you can, it, it's an easy war to say it's good versus evil. It's hard to do that with Vietnam, um, especially considering the fact that the U.S. Uh, did not uh, emerge victorious in that war. Um, it's certainly a war that has a lot of uh, pop culture history reference. Uh, there's definitely, it played a instrumental role in shaping the United States that we live in today. We still live with a lot of the effects of the war uh, on our society and culture to this day. And it's a war that shook this nation to its very core. However, from a remembrance standpoint, it's a war that those who fought in it often uh, want to remember the war in a different way than the rest of society remembers it. Unlike World War II, where you can be proud of your service and proud of your experience and you'll have the same support from the public, Vietnam is not that kind of war. But that's not really the point of this discussion. The reason I bring those those issues up is because there really are two separate camps when you look at Vietnam, Vietnam the Vietnam conflict, and the history that is portrayed out there by those who are writing about the conflict. You have those who essentially portray the war as unwinnable, and um, I would never say any war is unwinnable, but you certainly have those who portray the war as unwinnable politically, which it may have been for the United States, and they tend to justify the anti-war protesters and the um, you know, opposition and what have you to the war and view Vietnam as just a total uh, bungling of U.S. efforts and, and basically state that the U.S. should never have been involved. And then you have those who... Um, fall into a more revisionist history standpoint, those like Louis uh, Sorley, who portray the war more in a uh, positive light, stating that the U.S. was winning and that the only reason we didn't win was because the journalists and politicians kind of stabbed us in the back and refused to let America win. You'll certainly see a large degree of the latter uh, tended to be veterans uh, in the conflict, whereas a large degree of the former group uh, who were opposed to the war tend to be those maybe who were out there actively protesting or maybe journalists or what have you. So there's definitely baggage on both sides, uh, at least in many cases. Obviously not everyone. There's a lot of traditional historians out there as well who, who may have a more objective standpoint. But Vietnam's interesting in that a lot of the histories that have been written about the conflict tend to have um, very clear, I wouldn't call them, well, maybe we should just call them biases, uh, very clear agendas from those involved. Again, those who are 
uh, proponents uh, of the war itself or who want to justify their experience there are going to be much more positive about the conflict than those who were actively attempting to uh, stop the conflict so it's one of those things where unlike I would argue most of World War II history you have to be careful about what you read and know where the individual uh, that you're reading about is coming from that's not to say that anyone is wrong or vindictive or out for a you know some kind of evil agenda, but it is to say that um, you need to be, as always in any history, you need to be aware of the individual that you're reading and what their stance and their agenda may be, because everyone always has, um, or often has, a standpoint where they're coming from, and especially in more recent histories. You know, I think it's less of an issue when you're looking at a history of the Crusades, for example. But if you're looking at a more recent history, something that's happened in the lifetime of the individual who's writing about it and something where the individual who's writing about it may have been involved, it's something you need to be aware about. But that's enough rambling about kind of the different histories of the war. The reason I, I the, what really struck me about the Vietnam War is kind of this perception, and it's certainly backed up by Neil Sheenan's A Bright Shining Lie, which I read recently, um, where... It was just a bungled effort. You know, the U.S. got involved in this war. Uh, South Vietnam was uncapa incapable or perhaps unwilling to do what was necessary. And basically it was just this corrupt regime that was losing the population support, shelling innocent civilians, um, and just thoroughly corrupt and incapable of fighting a conflict against a more, um, I wouldn't say noble, but certainly a more... Um, effective northern side. That was certainly the standpoint I got from Neil Sheenan regarding the Vietnam War, especially the early war part uh, where he talks about kind of the South Vietnamese Army's inability to fight effectively by itself before America became heavily involved. Uh, those of you unfamiliar about it, I would certainly check the book out. It's uh, kind of one of the foremost uh, cited or one of the most well-regarded histories of the Vietnam War. It's more about a U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel, uh, John Paul Van, who was one of the early advisors uh, in 62 to 63 of the South Vietnamese Army, was there during the infamous Battle of Ap Bac, where the South Vietnamese Army was thoroughly embarrassed in a debacle of an affair uh, against the VC, and kind of shows how the situation in Vietnam was beginning to unravel prior to major U.S. commitments to the theater in 1964 and 65. It then goes on to talk about how U.S. involvement really didn't um, really make the situation better. It basically propped up the South Vietnamese government, but that there was still tremendous corruption. The American style of warfare was ill-suited to Vietnam, and the American military was largely delusional. It's interesting that Sheenan doesn't portray the military as evil or um, anything along those lines. He certainly doesn't portray the military as a baby, you know, the sort of stereotypical baby killer mentality, rather delusional uh, in that the U.S. military was just simply delusional about what it was accomplishing. And goes on to, to basically, it's more of a biography of John Paul Van in kind of the context of Vietnam. It has some very um, good character profiles of some individuals. Um, but kind of talks more, it certainly focuses more heavily on uh, the early war period. And it's a book I definitely recommend checking out. A, a good counter to that book would be Louis Sorley's book on Vietnam titled A Better War, um, which looks at the later war period under General Creighton Abrams. Now it's interesting because both authors have very clear, um, I don't I don't know if bias is the right word, but very clear agendas involved in their books. Sorley was a veteran of the Vietnam War. Uh, obviously, throughout his writing, you can see he thinks very highly of General Creighton Abrams. The book reads more of an autobiography from Creighton Abrams, given all the quotes that are included in it, than it does a, a traditional history. Um, whereas Sheenan was a journalist who was in Vietnam during the early war period and uh, was a close associate with John Paul Van. Uh, during the early war uh, period and you know obviously has his own agenda so you can see uh, where each of them are coming from but with that being said uh, it is interesting to look at the Vietnam War and, and I'm kind of going back to what I was 
intending to talk about is that this game, Vietnam 65, finally talking about this game and not rambling about the, the books, this game is interesting to me because it portrays itself as being a game about Vietnam during the in the I Drang Valley in 1965. And certainly, you know, there, there's the air cav element, there's um, not so much a delta type element, certainly more of a forest kind of um, highlands type terrain here uh, that it seems to exist. But the game itself focuses more on pacification. And that's why I referenced those two authors. That's why I referenced Sheenan and Sorley, because Sheenan talks about the war principally under General Creighton Abrams, who Sheenan goes to great lengths talking about. He more or less ignored the concept of pacification. You know, he thought it was a waste of time. America would win the war militarily, crush the VC, or trip them, basically kill them faster than they could be... Um, replenished themselves, sort of this mythical crossover point where the VC would be losing more men than they could replace. And Sheenan talks a fair bit about that, uh, where Sorley talks more about hold and clear, which was sort of General Creighton Abrams' strategy, uh, which the idea was there was a much more aggressive pacification effort under General Creighton Abrams. There was the highly controversial Phoenix program, which was kind of a counterinsurgency program, which existed throughout South Vietnam. And by the end of Creighton Abrams' uh, time in Vietnam, the South Vietnamese government did control a large percentage of uh, the villages and population. And the guerrilla aspect of the conflict had been, to a large degree, uh, reduced to uh, more of a conventional war uh, than during Westmoreland's time, which was more typified by the search and destroy missions into the jungles, uh, getting ambushed by guerrilla groups, uh, going into villages and having the population be strongly against you, and never really knowing who was on your side or who wasn't. Now, the latter of not really knowing who to trust, I don't think really disappeared under Creighton Abrams during the later war period. And, and by war period, we're talking about you know, Abrams' mentality was more 69 to 72, kind of that period of, I believe he actually took command in 68, but it was after the Tet Offensive in 68. Whereas Westmoreland was in command in Vietnam from 64 to 68, so kind of the initial buildup to the, um, to the th to and through the Tet Offensive during Vietnam. And the, the two wars were very different conflicts. But I think it's interesting, again, I'm coming back to the game, the entire point of this rambling, which there's quite a bit of rambling here, but the entire point of this rambling is to talk about this game, uh, in that, which I don't feel I'm doing very well at this point, but the point is, this game positions itself as a game about the conflict in the Central Highlands. And it's only 45 turns, and it's supposed to be 1965. However... The game brings in armored units later in it. You know, you see some uh, Vietnamese PT-76s, uh, which were light tanks, not too much of a threat, but certainly uh, vehicles that weren't nearly as common in 65 as they would be later uh, in, in the war. And it also focuses very heavily on pacification. The whole goal of this game is to get the population pacified, uh, and basically just fend off the enemy forces long enough so that you can pacify the population. It's not about seeking out and destroying enemy troops so much as it is about seeking out and just getting your troops into these villages. You certainly want to destroy the enemy because they, they play a role in the pacification element of the game. You know, if, uh, if you don't destroy any enemy units, that's going to hurt your pacification score but to me it seems the mechanic is if you get your men into the villages frequently enough then you'll identify where the enemy is and destroy them and that will allow you to pacify the enemy as opposed to William Westmoreland's early war strategy which was much less let's pacify the population and much more let's seek out and destroy the enemy so the villages almost are irrelevant in Westmoreland's strategy uh, the goal is more to hunt down the enemy and destroy it. And at least in the way this game plays to me, it seems to be more about winning the hearts and minds and pacification, which, despite the rhetoric, William Westmoreland really ignored that to a large degree. He found that type of um, conflict perhaps ill-suited to what America wanted to do. 
What he really wanted to do was these giant uh, multi-battalion unit organizations, and then this era in combat, and in this case, actually, Sheenan and um, Sorley both agree that under William Westmoreland's time in Vietnam, it was typified by these massive uh, multi-battalion operations where a large U.S. unit would sweep through a part of the jungle and attempt to obliterate a Vietnamese unit, which is really not at least how I, I play this game. It doesn't feel like that's the ideal way to play this game, is kind of hammer and anvil. The goal doesn't seem to be you to put uh, troops into the middle of nowhere and drive the enemy against you. No, because of the way the game plays, it has a guerrilla element where the... VC units, as soon as they attack you or you attack them, uh, if they uh, if they survive, they flee just into basically nowhere, which seems to lend more credence to the early war, more guerrilla style of the conflict, because again, by the late war period under Creighton Abrams, thanks largely because of the losses at Tet, the war was becoming an increasingly conventional conflict, uh, whereas under Westmoreland there was a lot more small ambushes and what have you. But despite that element, the actual goal of pacifying the population and having an active, active pacification program uh, with the attempt of shutting the countryside out from the Vietnamese, that was really ignored by Creighton Abrams. And, and that is told, or not, sorry, not by Creighton Abrams, but by William Westmoreland. And that will be backed up if you read Neil Sheenan's history uh, under A Bright Shining Lie. If you read that that book, it'll talk all about how Creighton, or oh my goodness, I'm screwing them all up. It'll talk all about how General William Westmoreland more or less ignored the idea of pacifying the population. The book certainly discounts the effectiveness of this, unlike Sorley's history, which says that it was very successful. But both uh, authors talk about how there was at least some shift under Creighton Abrams to doing more in the way of pacification and doing more in the way of attempting to um, win the, the population support. In fact, during uh, Westmoreland's time and, and before his time as well, under General Paul Harkins, who was Westmoreland's predecessor, there was a program called the Strategic Hamlet Program, which basically forcibly relocated large numbers of uh, Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, individuals into hamlets uh, that were called strategic hamlets which ended up becoming a breeding ground for the VC because they were poorly policed and, and secured and basically brought all these people together where they'd be more easily uh, swayed into joining the VC you know the home was a very important part of Vietnamese culture and the Americans and South Vietnamese more or less ignored that uh, by just you know saying you're gonna you're gonna move because Obviously, that would anger large parts of the population. The other aspect of the game which seems missing is sort of the free fire zone effect. You know, the game gives you artillery but only lets you target known VC locations. If this game was going to try and be more of an early war 1965 look, then it would focus more on the ability to basically just shell random spots on the map where you suspect a NVA or VC unit might be. That would certainly give the game more of a 1965 or 66 feel. Uh, Westmoreland was well aware that these free fire zones existed. Uh, in fact, he was unconcerned with the impact it was having on the population. There were individuals who basically told him, hey, listen, you know, isn't this going to turn the population against this? Aren't there going to be many, many people who are killed, many innocent people who are killed by this program? And he seemed to think, more or less, it was ideal to depopulate the countryside and create these refugees because it meant it would be more easy, easy to keep an eye on the population if they're all stuck in a few large cities, even as refugees, uh, than over thousands of hamlets throughout the villages. But the point of that is that there were these free fire zones where the South Vietnamese forces and the U.S. forces would just kind of lob shells and launch arc-like raids against them with massive B-52 bombing runs against often desolate jungle. Um, and if this game is attempting to model 65, I would think it would have that ability to basically launch blind, uh, you know, blind raids against empty hexes. You know, allow me to drop. I think you can do it with airstrikes, but you can't do it with artillery where you just call it in on an empty hex. 
So I think that would be another interesting element to add to this game, which would make the game more like 65. Uh, like I said, the game feels much more like a game about 1972 or 1970, uh, where the goal is legitimately to let's move through these villages and let's, at least according to Abrams, the goal in 1970, 71, 72, you know, and later was to provide security for the Vietnamese. It was, you know, make them feel secure because you're never going to win this war unless you've got a secure population. And whether you agree that this was accomplished or that the reason the war transferred from being a guerrilla conflict to a conventional conflict was more just the devastating losses that the VC suffered in 68 at Tet and never really recovered, um, the VC, I probably should have prefaced this, during Vietnam, the VC was called the Viet Cong, and they were the kind of guerrilla force in the South, which was made up of largely South Vietnamese fighting against the North, the National Liberation Front, or, sorry, fighting against the South and the Americans. They were called the National Liberation Front. They were also, uh, by the U.S., called the VC, or Victor Charlie. Um, whether, whether it was... Again, they launched a massive offensive in 68, 1968 during the Tet Offensive, uh, which was during the Tet Holiday, which is kind of the new year for Vietnam, in which they were absolutely devastated, suffering tens of thousands of casualties and never really fully recovered. Uh, they launched another offensive later in that year, which kind of was the coup de grace and finished off what was left of them. And again, they never really recovered. So you could there are those who argued that uh, the VC never recovered because... They simply lost too many men, or there were those who argued that uh, the VC were decimated but never really recovered because of the changes in policy that Creighton Abrams kind of encouraged. But anyway, I'm getting, again, distracted from the fact that this game is fundamentally a game about running around to different villages and kind of taking the thermometer of the people there, providing security to the people there, and then using the information you get from the people to track down and destroy the enemy. That is not a 1965 approach to Vietnam, in my opinion. That's a 1970 or 1972 approach. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I, again, that's just kind of my own comment on the game. It's still a really fun game in which you can tell I'm really struggling here to maintain uh, maintain any semblance of control here. We've got several villages, kind of like three, I'd say three villages on the northern end and then two kind of in the southern end which were fairly easily controlling, but uh, on the more densely jungle areas we're just getting absolutely mauled by these RPG units. The guerrilla attacks, I would certainly agree, as we attempt to move through these forests is very, um, very late war-like. But the, um, there you go, another airstrike. But I would like, if we're going to say it's an early war conflict, it would be nicer to be able to call in airstrikes more freely, you know, give you more airstrikes. However, um, allow you to call them in on, or maybe even encourage you to call them in on empty hexes. Same with artillery. Let me shell an empty hex. If I think an enemy unit's there, I should be able to do it. And obviously, just with the sheer number of hexes, it's unlikely you're going to hit your target. But hey, um, it still be a, an interesting depiction of the conflict. But I think that's enough rambling about Vietnam. Again, uh, two books that I recommend checking out because of how uh, diametrically opposed they are to each other uh, a Bright Shining Lie by Neil Sheenan, and A Better War by Lewis Sorley. Again, the, the books couldn't give you a more stark uh, opinion about how different the conflict was, uh, but at the same time, it's interesting too because I think Sorley's, one of his chief critics criti criticisms is the fact that the late war period receives very little coverage in uh, historical uh, analysis and he's right in that the vast majority of Americans look at the conflict up until and just slightly after the Tet Offensive uh, which was a very different conflict so I think it'd be an interesting look um, I'm not really trying to turn this into a book review but it is something that I would check out uh, now here in this case in this conflict I'm struggling because I don't have a fire base uh, I would have liked to have placed a fire base in there by those villages but apparently I can't place one in newly bulldozed territory or maybe I need more open territory around it. The downside of course is now that my engineer unit was destroyed by an RPG just the other turn uh, is that I'm gonna have a very very difficult time because there's no way to put that uh, no way to put that firebase there and without that firebase all these units that just kinda pop up and what have you are going to be um, 
unable to be countered by artillery fire, and I only get an airstrike every five turns. So, while the hearts and minds score is still fairly close, and we still have positive political points, I get the feeling things are going to go very far south very soon here, as we're about halfway through this game. Um, and my criticisms of the game aren't, you know, I know this isn't an ultra-detailed um, chit-counting game, so I wouldn't say that, you know, saying this game feels more like 70 than 65 is really a, a horrible criticism. It's a much more beer and pretzels style game. But I think it'd be an interesting look at the uh, at the conflict if they did that. Um, if they kind of just call it what it is. Call it a 1969 or a 1970 conflict game because the inclusion of armored units in the NBA increasingly becoming more and more important seems much more uh, in tune with uh, the late war period of the conflict than it does uh, the early war. Or at the very least, it seems much more in tune with the uh, period of the conflict as a whole. You know, so you start out with more... VC or South Vietnamese guerrilla units, and then as the war progresses, you see more and more NVA units. It's not really about 65. You could say it's about the entire war if you want. Um, but yeah, I don't really think this is applicable just to the Idrang Valley. There's nothing about this game that strikes me as this is a game about the Idrang Valley in Vietnam, and so much more is just this is a game about counterinsurgency in Vietnam. But anyway, folks, that's a little bit more of a convoluted and rambly discussion than I had intended for this video. I actually was hoping to have a fairly coherent discussion of kind of the difference in differences in uh, Vietnam's reality versus where the game is at, uh, and maybe more how it more closely aligned to the later war period during the Vietnam War. Um, I think I kind of missed the mark on that, but still wanted to share my thoughts and uh, kind of uh, experiences, if you will, with this game. One thing that I would recommend, though, uh, as I've clearly uh, begun to suffer here, uh, the hearts and minds scores dropping precipitously. We've lost a huge amount of political support in a very short period of time and lost a huge amount of casualties around this kind of southern village here, uh, maybe our own little Tet Offensive, if you will. Um, one thing that I will say is that I would recommend, you know, if you are interested in the Vietnam War, check out Louis Sorley's book, uh, A Better War. Um, it's it's a good uh, good place to start. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the definitive history on the Vietnam War. I don't know if there really is a definitive history on the Vietnam War. It's so hard for most of the people who are involved to remove any kind of uh, perception of, of where they stand on the conflict and what they think was right. Uh, I think we'll probably get a better look at the conflict, maybe in some revisionist history, give us 50 years to, to reevaluate things. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly a very good... Um, a very good work. Uh, I, I highly recommend it. And um, it reads more like a biography of uh, General Creighton Abrams than anything. But nonetheless, I would highly recommend checking it out. It's uh, very well done. There's a lot of really great sources, a lot of great primary uh, source material. And if you're going to read that, I also recommend re reading Neil Sheenan's book, uh, A Bright Shining Lie which certainly kind of paints the opposite picture of Vietnam. Uh, they're both very well done. I actually, like I said, coming into reading both of these books within the last couple of weeks, I, honestly, I didn't know much about Vietnam. I'm hardly an expert from reading these two books, but I think these books uh, give a good, kind of a good counter to each other. Uh, another one that I was kind of twittering at... Uh, tweeting, twittering, whatever, at uh, Bruce Gehrig, who's uh, doing his own series on the Vietnam conflict. Uh, you can see there, I feel like Air Power more recently misses more often than it used to, but uh, he recommended a book called uh, Triumph Forsaken. I haven't actually read the book yet, but it focuses more on the early war year period uh, from 70, 54 to 70, or 54 to 65, and uh, kind of looks at more DM's regime who was the dictator in charge of South Vietnam until the U.S. helped overthrow him because um, they were unhappy with him. But he looks at more of kind of the period under Diem and kind of seems, at least from the title, I would assume he claim, claims that maybe we would have, we mismanaged things, but uh, it was a winnable war. He recommended looking at that book, so I have not read it. I can't speak to it, but that's another book you might want to look into. 
Um, but anyway, folks, uh, that's going to just about do it here for this video. It turned into more of a ramble session than I had hoped. I feel like that happens with a lot of my videos where I would rather uh, give a, a more structured look at the uh, at games and, and topics. And I don't think I do a good enough job of that, but uh, it is what it is. Um, I still wanted to share my thoughts, and uh, this game is clearly going to be a loss, uh, down to about 40 hearts in mind, with basically no political will, and uh, running low on helicopters, so this one's not going to turn out well. The veteran ate me alive, uh, I'm going to blame the map, but again, uh, I think that's probably part of playing the veteran level of the game. Anyway, guys, we're going to cut this video out. We probably won't follow up with it. Uh, as you can see, my hearts and mind score is already down into the 30s. So, uh, yeah, chalk that one up as a U.S. defeat. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer signing out.